to. There's no precedent in American history for this country playing that kind of role internationally. The United States was conspicuously absent, not from the system, but from any leadership role in the system for a century and a half before the mid 20th century. So these, these are enormous changes. Uh, again, let me just remind you one last thing about this. In 1940, the government did not keep uh, poverty statistics in 1940. That's an artifact mostly of the Johnson anti-poverty programs in the 1960s. Uh, but some scholars, notably uh, James Patterson, uh, have uh, tried to reconstruct using the later poverty threshold uh, de definitions what the poverty situation looked like in 1940. <clears throat> and the result is that, the, the conclusion is that 45% of all white households live below the poverty line, and 95% of all African-American households live below the poverty line in 1940. This was a poor country <clears throat> in 1940. It was an economically sick and blighted country, and it had been for a decade decade of the Great Depression. Anybody who could have imagined that just a half decade hence, uh, this society would enter onto this period of absolutely fabulous prosperity. The average, an average annual growth rate from 1945 to 1968, almost a quarter of a century, was 3.79%. Round numbers, 4% annual growth rate for a quarter century run on average. That's a phenomenal achievement. Uh, for any advanced industrial society. Chinese growth rates for the last 10 decade or decade and a half or so have been higher than that, but started from an extremely low base. Uh, this was already a, a fairly advanced industrial society, and to grow at 4% a year for two plus decades was an enormous accomplishment. Okay, so between 1940 and 1945, something happens. What was it? It was World War II. So the, the World War II is a kind of a black box in that city through which this society historically passes and comes out very, very different on the other side. Now, how did this happen? Uh, my students at Stanford, maybe your students too, sometimes uh, you get them to really talk frankly about what they think about the study of history. My students will sometimes say, you know, Professor Kennedy, the, the trouble with the study of history is it's just one damn thing after another. <laughs> Uh, and there's something to that, I suppose, a general proposition. But in this case, if you take nothing else away from this morning's discussion, I hope you'll take away the idea that the transformative effects of World War II, internally in American society, externally in the international system this country is placed in, are, these are not a case of just one damn thing after another. These were not simply incidental effects of policies pursued for other reasons. These were deliberately, the, the, the policies on the basis of which the United States fought World War II were deliberately and shrewdly articulated and became the guiding principles of action uh, in, this, uh, in this period. Okay, um, let me, well, let's, since I got the slides up here, let me show you a few. Um, these, of course, are the big four at the uh, Versailles uh, Peace Conference in 1919, Lloyd George, uh, Clemenceau, uh, Vittorio Orlando, and Woodrow Wilson. Um, Herbert Hoover, who's also president of this conference, incidentally, um, is, I think, unambiguously a failed president, and he got a lot of things wrong about uh, understanding his historical situation uh, when he was in office. But he got one thing, I think, notably right. Uh, when he said in the first, I believe it's the first sentence of the volume in his memoirs, where he enters the period of the Great Depression, he says, I can't quote it exactly, but I'll get it pretty close. He said, the Great Depression of the 1930s had its origins in the war, Great War of 1914 to 1918. And I think that's a deep truth. Uh, that war, the First World War, so disrupted uh, an international system and all its component national parts uh, that it, the Great Depression, in a sense, is the, the payoff, the, the, the ultimate uh, consequence of that uh, disruption and the post-World War I efforts to try to repair the damage uh, that World War I uh, had done to that system. Uh, further beneath that, I'm going to go back a little bit to what I was talking about yesterday. I think it, uh, Hoover had it right that we must understand the Great Depression as an international or global phenomenon. 
Uh, to understand the Depression as an exclusively American uh, episode, or an episode the remedies to which lay entirely in the hands of one country, this one, and to, to be specific, is to go off, I think, on the wrong historical trail. Uh, when Hoover insisted, for example, that uh, Franklin Roosevelt participate in the London Economic Conference in June of 1933, something that Roosevelt ultimately refused to do, uh, what Hoover was in, in, fact, in effect saying was that this is an international, global uh, situation we find ourselves in here. We must cooperate with other countries if we're going to effectively find the remedy for this, and Roosevelt didn't want to do that. And in fact, you could, you could argue, I will argue, that uh, there were people who observed the failure of particularly the democracies to cooperate at that London Economic Conference in 1933, uh, and concluded that they had nothing to fear from concerted or joint action by these countries. They couldn't even come together to agree on common economic policies. They were very unlikely to come together to agree on strategic or military policies. And of course, the principal observer who came to that conclusion was Adolf Hitler. So it might say this is an overstatement, but it captures some kind of reality, I think, that the, the Franklin Roosevelt's failure to participate in and nurture that economic conference in 1933, the last chance for a concerted international counter blow to the Depression, made necessary his later military confrontation with Adolf Hitler because he just lost the opportunity there to find a way to remedy the Depression uh, much sooner than uh, eventually happened. Okay. Um, this purports to be the London Economic Conference, but the, it's, it's a, the photograph is not accurate because Roosevelt wasn't there. I don't know how this got in the slide deck. This, of course, the, this, uh, those of you who know German know this as our last hope is Hitler. This is the kind of propaganda that Hitler used to uh, rally support. He was, let us not forget, he came to power by democratic means uh, in 1932. He was installed as chancellor just weeks in 1933 before Franklin Roosevelt was installed as president of the United States. The parallels in their two lives are actually quite striking. They were born in the same decade, in the 1880s. They come to power within weeks of each other, 1932 and 1933. They die in the same month, I believe, that's accurate, in 1945, within days of each other. Uh, so it's an interesting way to think about this period, is to think about the different trajectories of these two lives and what they meant, what, what they, their different ways of leadership meant for their two societies. And again, this is just a reminder of where it all begins. And here's a reminder of what dominant American sentiment was about the European crisis as it developed into shooting war, eventually in 1939, uh, was to stay out. I mean, what, what, what for my generation, and, the, and I guess the subsequent generation, became the great disillusionment about Vietnam uh, as a war that never to be repeated. Uh, the generation, the interwar generation, felt the same way about World War I. That American intervention in World War I had been a great mistake. It had cost 100,000 American lives, and Europe was in worse shape after the war than it had been before the war. It had seen fascist revolutions in Italy, Nazis emerged in Germany, Bolsheviks in Russia. What was the good of the American intervention and all those lost lives? Uh, and the, the, the sentiment was never again will we intervene in the European war. And here, this is. Uh, mothers protesting the Lend-Lease Act, which you mentioned incidentally since you mentioned Lend-Lease. Uh, we think Lend-Lease provided about 25% of the war material for the United Kingdom and about 10% for the Soviet Union. So not, not trivial, but let's keep it in proportion. There's Charles Lindbergh, you were asking about him, Witt, uh, who was, of course, the famous aviator uh, and uh, visited Nazi Germany many times during the 1930s. And uh, it was often misunderstood as expressing sympathy for Nazi Germany. I don't think that's exactly what his sentiment was. But he certainly respected the, and admired the way in which Germany had recovered from the Depression much more rapidly than the United States had. And he was impressed with just the power that the Germans were marshalling, especially air power was something he knew about, uh, and became uh, a voice of caution as the United States debated in the late 1930s, early 1940s, aiding the British and eventually the Soviets in the struggle against Hitler, he thought that Hitler was going to win. Uh, 
no matter what we did, and we were just squandering resources if we transferred them to the British in 1940 and 1941. Uh, his his um, uh, obstructionism, his objections to uh, American efforts to aid the British and the, later the Russians uh, was so great that at one point, as I was mentioning to Witt last night, uh, it's recorded in Harold Ickey's diary. Harold Ickey was Secretary of the Interior uh, in the Roosevelt administration. That one evening, Roosevelt, in exasperation, <coughs> turned to Ickes and he said, You know, Harold, if I die tonight in my bed overnight, I want you to know and tell the world that I think Charles Lindbergh is a Nazi, <laughs> which was a great overstatement, but it re represented uh, the kind of frustration that Roosevelt felt. Uh, 